OK, we're recording. Um, so uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, this is a talk from Glenn Dimplex. We've got Chris and Francesco from Glenn Dimplex. We'll be talking about heat pumps um, and uh, we'll hand it straight over to them. And uh, we we'll look forward to hearing more about what you have to say. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, I hope you've all had your lunch. Um, this this format for us has become quite big actually over the last year you know cpds for us all we're all um usually meeting guys like you guys and girls and um you know trying to get as much food as we can in the first 10 minutes and then obviously a great presentation so this for us is an interesting format and, and we thank you all for inviting us to come along um so the format is, is it's an interesting format because my broadband's being changed it, it changed at my house as i speak so i'm going to start the presentation off and my colleague francesco will run us through to the end of the presentation and obviously if you've got any questions can i ask um for us to leave at the end and then we can um go forward from there so hopefully you can all see my presentation and i'm going to give you a quick introduction to uh glenn dimplex and the glenn dimplex group before we start with the cpd on heat pumps. First thing I'd like to say is I've, I've worked for Glen Dimplex for 11 years now and I'm one of our regional sales managers so I, I look after the southwest which is great with the Wessex area and I've got a team going across the um, southwest dealing with um, consultants, architects, looking at um, M&E requirements and, and I think one thing you'll see through the presentation is Glen Dimplex now Dimplex aren't just storage heaters and panel heaters. So, okay. So, who are Glen Dimplex? Glen Dimplex is a leading international group. Um, lot, not a lot of people know that. You know, we have over thirty businesses and ten thousand employees across the world, and we often, we often have issues where people don't know who we are. We're actually based in Southern Ireland. We've got manufacturing facilities around the world, as I said. And our main drive, um, we offer unrivaled range of low carbon heating, cooling, ventilation, and heating products across the whole scope of um, heating, and venti he heating and ventilation. So Glen Dimplex was formed in 1973 and we're still owned by the same family and the founder actually still goes to work. The world's, we are the world's largest heating manufacturers. Um, we hold significant positions in the, the domestic appliance market, and you'll see some of the companies we own and brands we look after. We have an annual turnover of just over two billion. Um, we're privately owned, as I said, and we, we are very pro and very keen on decarbonisation and all the other parts that go with it. This is including years of constant investment in our renewables technology, which we're going to talk about today. So the UK operation. Well, the UK is quite an interesting beast at the moment with Brexit and everybody. So our head office is in Dunleer, which is based an hour away from um, Dublin. We've got three manufacturing sites. So two two in Northern Ireland. Hello, hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, so we've got manufacturing facilities in um, Northern Ireland, Southern Ireland. We have a national distribution centre with all our products in, in um, up near Liverpool. We have a design studio, which isn't where that is. It's actually in London. And if any of you are in London, it's in Shoreditch. And it's got a lot of our commercial um, product offerings in there, particularly our heat pumps and our zero off ambient temperature network that we do. And our head office where myself and Francesco are based from is based in Southampton. So these are some of the brands we will look after. There's a lot more and I'll just pick some out. Most people say, oh, I haven't got Dimplex storage heater or I haven't got Dimplex panel heater in my house, but you'd be surprised how many of you guys have got something in their house. And when you look at Morphe Richards, Roberts Radios, Belling Cookers, those sort of things, those are a lot more in the domestic appliance market that we do, but we were quite strongly into obviously electric, as you would understand electric and renewables energy, and also water heating. We do a lot of water heating, extraction through Expel Air, water heating through Red Ring. And also um, we've, we've purchased, and it's not on this slide, three years ago, 
a company called Ability Fan Coils or Ability Projects based down in Southampton. So it gives us an our whole HVAC solution offering in, and, and specifically with the future home standards, which we're not going to cover today, but it's another really good CPD understanding the future home standards, how it's going to affect buildings um, and the part L and part F regulations that are coming, which is one of the CPDs we deliver basically on a daily basis at the moment. So we're now going to start the presentation. So my colleague Francesco is um, going to take over sharing the screen. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me OK? Yes, I can hear you, Francesco. OK, fantastic. So a uh, little introduction about myself. Um, as Chris said, I, I work with them for Glenn Implex. I'm based in Southampton and I've been working uh, for the company for now three and a half years. Uh, it's been an interesting journey and on, on a daily basis, I I might spend 70 to 80 percent of my time working on heat pumps. So at the end of the presentation, if you have any technical question or any clarification you, you might need, just feel free to, uh, to ask any question you want. Let's keep the um, presentation as uh, Chris already said, and let's start with the contents of um, our CPD. So first of all, we're going to talk about heat pump, so we have to understand um, how the current legislation works within heat pumps and how it facilitates heat pump manufacturers and how it produces um, a way to um, use, basically phase out older systems for heating and domestic hot water like gas or electric heating and um, gives heat pump a great advantage. So I will explain to you basically how it works, what are the principles behind this type of machine, and then we're going to see how it can help you uh, comply with the uh, with regulations. So first of all, it's important to distinguish between drivers and incentives. So uh, it's mainly a semantic difference. Drivers are uh, basically legislations enforced by the government or other entities and you have to comply with them, so you have no choice. Um, we have part L of the building regulations, which is the new one, but also um, there are additional uh, entities that will provide all the, um, all the certification, like, for example, the BRIAM, uh, which is very, very important for high standard buildings. On the other hand, we have incentives that will help financially um, people who decide to go through uh, using a heat pump or a renewable energy system uh, in order to future-proof or to improve the um, CO2 emissions of any building. And we will uh, uh, explore both of those, um, of those legislation types. So first of all, what is a heat pump? Um, if I go too much basic, I, I apologize, but it does many of you and I'd, I'd rather go uh, be thorough about this. So uh, a heat pump is basically um, a device able to transfer energy at low temperature into another mean at a usable temperature. Um, energy at low temperature, what it means. So uh, for example, a heat pump can use the heat stored in very cold air or water or the ground to heat up a substance called the refrigerant, which is nothing more than uh, a substance which has a very low uh, temperature evaporation, uh, evaporation temperature, sorry, and uses uh, the heat of this refrigerant to heat up another mean, usually water, to provide heating or hot water uh, to dwellings and buildings. Um, the main parts of, um, of a heat pump are those, as I said, so there's the refrigerant, which is the, um, uh, the vector that uses um, the heat pump uses to uh, transport this heat. Um, on this part, you can have, uh, for example, a borehole with the ground, or you can have an open pipe that goes into a river or a lake. And uh, by means of a circuit, you use the heat at low temperature 
to go and evaporate the refrigerant within the evaporator, which is nothing more than a plate heat exchanger. After that, you compress the gas by means of a compressor, which reaches a higher temperature, and you use this higher temperature in the condenser, which is nothing more than another uh, heat exchanger, to heat up water. And the second circuit is water going inside the dwelling or building. After this cycle is complete, the refrigerant is expanded in the expansion valve, goes back in the evaporator, and the cycle um, begins again. Uh, slightly different is an air source heat pump because it doesn't have this uh, circuit here. It just had, has a grill and a fan, and it draws in air from external or internal spaces to heat the refrigerant inside the evaporator. Mm, there are, as I said, those are the three main types of heat pumps, but there are so many variants of them. You can have hot water heat pumps, uh, ambient loop heat, pu heat pumps, you can have heat pumps driven instead of by um, electricity by combustion engines. So um, it's like dog breeds, you have very, very specific use for every specific uh, type of heat pump. The way we measure efficiency of heat pumps is slightly different from standard systems. It's because with uh, one unit of electricity driving the compressor, uh, you can have multiple units of heat delivered to your, to your ambient. And the main factors we use are the COP and the SCOP. It's worth mentioning also the SPF, but um, legislation mainly deal with the SCOP nowadays. So what does it mean? The COP is the coefficient of performance and simply measures following um, the SPF 14511, uh, this very simple formula. So it's, test, um, it's tested in the lab and the heat produced divided by uh, the electricity consumed by the compressor gives, the, gives you the COP. When you go to the SCOP or SPF, uh, as you can see, uh, the word seasonal is added, and it means that uh, it's a more thorough calculation that takes into account many different factors. So um, obviously, as you might imagine, if I have to heat the space and the outside temperature is minus 15, my efficiency will be lower than when outside is 15 degrees. So this takes into account the, the heat requirement and hot water requirement um, at different times of the year. And in the case of the SCOP, it also takes into account areas where the, the heat pump is installed. Um, it's not very precise because if you think that there are just three main areas that um, the legislation distinguished with, and London and Athens or Rome are in the same area, you can see that is um, it's quite limited, but this is the, the factor we use to provide the, um, the efficiency for, for of our heat pumps. Yes, this is the legislation that drives the SCOP, BSCN 14825, as I, as I said, calculates the SCOP for uh, a wide range of heat pumps, not all heat pumps. Um, I can explain it a little bit further later, but for example, uh, ambient loop heat pumps don't have an SCOP, and also uh, it doesn't calculate the SCOP for domestic hot water heat pumps. But yeah, the great majority of, of heat pumps will comply with, uh, the SCOP will be calculated uh, following these legislations. You need part load test data, and actually we do have uh, in-house all the calculation sheets, and if you're interested, we, we can provide them. Um, and as I said before, it, oh, sorry, um, it distinguished between three climate zones. Uh, there is a um, colder, cold, and, and warmer. And at the end of it, you can also uh, adapt the SCOP specific to your building. And sometimes this might be useful, but sometimes uh, the calculation can be um, very complex and maybe not bring uh, as many advantages as, as you might think. So, uh, other than the SCOP, of course, you're going to select your heat pump based upon the, the output. In this graph, we can say 
we can see the, the output of the heat pump, so its capacity against the, uh, the COP at specific condition. B0 means brine at zero degrees and W35 is water 35 degrees. The bigger manufacturers uh, vary widely in range of output and COPs because obviously they, they try to address uh, different needs. Sometimes you need a big, bigger capacity, and I'm thinking about, the, um, for example, the heat pumps uh, present in Copenhagen um, in the bay. Uh, they, uh, they use the heat from the, from the sea, actually, and they need a bigger capacity, so sometimes they might um, decrease the, uh, the COP for this reason. But ideally, you want to maintain your efficiency as high as possible because this will impact greatly not only the um, CO2 emissions, but also the running costs. Uh, also, another differentiation between heat pumps is whether or not they use inverter. Uh, so an inverter uh, will be able to um, change and switch the, um, the compressive velocity infinitely. So you will have a ramp and you can access every single velocity of that ramp uh, inside the compressor, while other machines can have multiple uh, compressors at fixed um, speeds inside. So you can have what, the, what is called uh, often a multi-stage heat pump, which for example can have six compressors. Every compressor has just two speeds. So you have 12 steps of performance available to that machine. This is a quick example of how a better COP will decrease your running cost and CO2 emissions. I believe this figure is too high with the future home standard and it will be decreased further. Uh, but this is just to give you an idea so you can see how, how the effect is, is massive, it's huge, even with just a 1.5 uh, change in the SCOP. Um, this is, as I said, this is just an example, and you, you shouldn't rely on these quick calculations when you refer to running costs or CO2 emissions. You always should go through a SAP or the, um, the approved method of calculation. But um, this is a quick snapshot, and it, it actually shows you, even with higher figures than the, than the real ones, how much it differs. So let's start talking about regulations. Um, even the, so far, uh, local authorities have had the, the power to decide whether or not to improve the national regulations. And it appears that even though future home standard will increase greatly the, um, uh, the target to hit, uh, local authorities will still have the power to, to force improvements, which can be very challenging sometimes. As we've seen in the past, the London plan required 35% reduction over the carbon required by Part L. Um, this is interesting, and this is one of the reasons why, for example, our range of um, ambient loop heat pumps has been uh, very successful in London because you need to find innovative solutions to uh, to break that that wall if you want. You have to reach certain standards and you cannot keep on using the um, old technologies. So as I said, part L is the main part of regulations you have um, you have to follow and you have to comply with. Uh, it divides in four parts. You have um, part L. 1A, L1B, L2A, L2B, and it uh, deals with uh, domestic and non-domestic um, buildings, just the same. Compliance is demonstrated via um, a software called SBAM for commercial buildings, while it's demonstrated via SAP for domestic building. And at Glendin Platin House, we can run calculations in SAP. We cannot yet run calculation in, in SBAM, um, but it's, um, it's pretty straightforward to get these, these results in, in the industry. 
Okay, so the simplified building energy method, as I said, is the way uh, you um, prove compliance with the regulations with part L and calculates the TER and BER of your building. What are those? BER is the building emission rate, which is the, the calculated uh, CO2 um, emissions of your building after you enter your data into the, the software and it has to be lower or equal to the TER, which is the target emission rating. And this is uh, decided by the regulations and it depends on the um, uh, technologies you use, the fabric and all the characteristic of the building. Um, for example, I think, I'm thinking that for domestic dwellings, uh, it also depends on whether or not it's in an urban area or if it's um, uh, the grade of shading it has um, the, the degree of inclination of the windows. So there are a lot of data you have to enter to um, to get the results. This is a snapshot of how the, the software looks. And I have to say the um, SAP doesn't look much different. There are a lot of um, tabs here that presents the data and at the end of it you will get a result for the uh, kilograms of CO2 per square meter per year and this value has to be lower or equal to the target emission rate of that specific building. So other than this um, driver you can also have to comply with other uh, methodologies or certification. One of the most important is the BREAM certification, and it is basically a way to uh, prove that your, your building is excellent, is future-proofed, and it goes um, above and beyond what the regulation uh, sets. As you can see, this is best practice for sustainable design, and it typically covers um, government buildings, healthcare buildings, schools, offices, um, is not mandatory, but it's a great uh, thing to have if you, if you want to be uh, among the, the most sustainable. Um, it works with a system of points, and if you get all the points, you get 100%, and um, it goes down with percentages, as you can see from, from the right. Uh, CO2 savings is important, it's not everything, and it's worth mentioning, I think, that in the future, CO2 emissions will not no longer be the only method of judging whether or not a building complies with regulations, but there also is going to be uh, the primary energy factor to be considered. Um, uh, I think if you're interested in, that, in this, we have all the CPDs talking exactly about this. Yeah, so the, the drivers uh, bring in, uh, sometimes it's required, uh, especially if it's a high-end building or if it wants to win uh, prizes. Uh, it goes typically to prestigious developers and it obviously it requires planning applications and it's done um, by means of points and it's not only for new buildings but also for some refurbishments it, it can be used. <coughs> Now, to be honest, I've seen many very good buildings on the Brian, but I've, I've not seen a lot of excellent, which is the maximum. Quick snapshot of the points accredited by Brian, and the, the yellow one are the one affected by heat pumps. So that's very important to consider heat pumps, uh, especially for high-end prestigious buildings, because even just uh, considering the feasibility of a heat pump system will give you some points. And of course, it will not make the, the whole, but it will affect the energy efficiency of the building points, the monitoring, because the heat pumps can be connected to BMS systems, and it will help with uh, low or zero carbon technology. Also, if you look at the bottom, there's a section called innovation, and heat pumps can help greatly with this because uh, working with very low temperature heat, uh, you can be very creative with the way you, you create a source for those heat pumps. So uh, we're going to see, I think, a couple of uh, case studies uh, uh, later on, but I'm thinking about for example, waste heat 
from uh, electric cables or just formers or um, waste heat from um, the tube tunnels. Uh, all of these sources of waste that otherwise would just go into the environment can be used to power uh, even a big heat pump. And this helps a lot with the, with the innovation and the zero carbon technology points. Okay, um, this is a quick summary of what I've talked about so far. Um, just some takeaways from this. Remember what's the SCOP and that there is a legislation and if you want to see the calculation you have the right figures, you have to ask the manufacturer because it's a very complex calculation. Um, heat pumps can help you not only with the normal regulations such as building regulations, but L, but also with uh, higher accreditation such as BM. Heat pumps have big impact in buildings because they will provide many units of energy for every single unit of electricity you provide them. Um, and you can still use them even if the heating is very low in buildings uh, when you have a hot water demand that basically stays the same. SCOPs will vary in the industry as everything and it, it depends on whether or not you need a bigger output or a better efficiency. Please bear in mind that you don't need a bigger heat pump for a bigger load. You can also have a cascade of heat pumps that work uh, in conjunction one to the other. And sometimes this is preferable because, of course, over a, the course of a year, you're not always going to have the worst case scenario um, temperatures outside. So it's useful actually to have many stages or many heat pumps that can uh, phase out, turn off, and provide you exactly the amount of energy you need for that time of the year. Heat pumps offer lower carbon than gas, obviously because their efficiency is higher than 100%, and they help a lot, especially when you have stricter legislations, especially in London or Bristol. Um, of course, SCOP has an impact on running cost. We have seen the, the table, but uh, if you refer to um, to an appropriate calculator, you will see that uh, the running cost will decrease um, massively. And lastly, heat pumps historically used to attract RHI fundings. So I'm not sure what's happening now. It's, uh, it's uh, probably Chris will be better suited to, to speak about this. But um, historically, I think there's, um, there's a slide later on, Chris will talk about it you would have some funding in case you installed a um, heat pump in your building. And depending on which type of heat pump it was, whether or not it was air source or ground source and of your um, out front cost, you would get back money for every kilowatt hour you, you would use out of your heat pump. And it was very interesting. Uh, again, this legislation is changing, and I don't know what's happening with the future home standard and the 2025 um, target, but um, it's always good to, to know that there is also a financial funding available for heat pumps. Those are the case studies I was um, thinking about before. We have Bishop Wood Community Center. These had installed one of our heat pumps, a 100 kilowatt uh, ground source heat pump, and it uses only waste heat from a transformer. As I said, this would be 10 points for innovation in the BRIM. Um, the heating is completely provided by uh, waste heat, which means that um, theoretically you have um, only the running cost of the compressor. You don't have to provide anything else. Again, university, prestigious, building another ground source heat pump of 75 kilowatts and it runs under for heating which is one of the preferred technology for heating um, with heat pumps because the flow temperature shouldn't uh, shouldn't be higher than 55 degrees when you use a heat pump you do have higher temperature heat pumps such as um, you, you can get up to 75 quite easily but obviously in this case the, the SCOP gets lower and the meaning, the whole meaning of the technology uh, becomes less relevant because you're trying to reach temperatures of a, of a boiler 
and you're um, diminishing and decreasing the efficiency for the sake of not changing your, your design uh, on the building side. Uh, so yeah, a, a little caveat about this. When you use a heat pump, um, a little thought about um, the building side design of the meters and stored water, um, it's many, many times necessary. I think, Chris, do you, do you want to jump in from here? Um, Chris did um, say Chris he did might say he drop, might out. drop out. Okay. Um, um, so, so uh, uh, we do have we some have questions. Some questions. Okay. Yeah, um, as I said, uh, if I can quickly run through this. Um, again, I'm not entirely sure what's going to happen in the future, but this shows you that with the RHI, you used to have payment for every kilowatt hours you got out of your machine for 20 years. Okay, um, I'm happy to answer some questions if you want. Okay, okay great. great. Thank, Thank you so you much. So much um, so if we start off with the first question we have, uh, is there a way to have a CHP using heat pump to produce electricity from, from uh, heat? Um, uh, combined heat and power um, in regard to CHP. Um, uh, you happy to answer that, Francesco? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, the way you phrased it seems like the, the heat pump should be producing electricity. I think that's what the question is, yes. Okay, no, it, it doesn't work like that. A heat pump will produce heating, uh, <laughs> heated water or sometimes air. Um, yeah. I've never seen one used in conjunction with um, uh, CHP, to be honest. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you if you send me some details, I can look into it and see what what's available and what's possible. Okay. Um, if so, uh, uh, that's from uh, Alex. So Alex, if you have any more information on that, then please do send it across, and we can obviously connect you. Uh, with Francesco. Um, the next question is, um, so this is a bit more juicy, I guess. I have a client who is extending and altering his house. He wants to insulate the walls with external wall insulation system and upgrade all of the roof. Um, he cannot insulate the floor. Will this make a significant difference to the performance of the air source heat pump? Also, with regard to the U values and the air source heat pump, is there an optimum U value uh, for walls and roof? Uh, in essence, it, generally when you're doing the build, there's a cost versus real world benefit in essence. That's what the, mm -hmm. that's what the question is. Um, well, heat pumps will work better with a better insulation, but there's no optimal uh, U-value. And I would say the only situation in which I wouldn't use a heat pump is when you have, um, for example, very old and big buildings such as a church, which is converted to a warehouse and you want to make it um, livable without improving the insulation. Uh, but I think if you reach very, even below standard insulation in a, in a house, like a 60s um, standard, a heat pump will be uh, useful. And of course, the, the performance will be affected, but I think it, it won't be a massive um, decrease of efficiency. Right. I guess in essence, uh, just as sort of a tag on to that is, uh, are there any types of buildings where a heat pump in particular would not be suitable in your experience? Um, no, not really, unless, as I said, there are little to no insulation at all, because mm -hmm. here, you know, the, the flow temperature out of a heat pump is not 80 degrees. Mm -hmm. Ideally, is 55 to 60. So sometimes if you have very big spaces or uh, a lot, like great losses, uh, mm -hmm. might not be enough. I think, okay. I think I'll think i jump in with you there, Fran. I think heat pumps, particular, particularly air source heat pumps, got bad press um, through poor design, poor lower end temperatures, poor um, or, or use of flow boilers or things like uh, immersions to top up temperature at low temperatures. And I think there was a huge misunderstanding of the product. You've got a bad name. Now, when you design a heat pump installation correctly, it's installed correctly, and you've got the right insulation, 
it will work in any property, but those are big asks, and I understand that is a big ask for most people to deal with. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for that, Chris. That's Chris. Uh, Chris uh, Verinder is back with us. Um, well, I'm sort of in and out. Let's. Oh. Say oh okay. Oh, you, we, we'll keep you. We're only going for a few more minutes. Um, uh, so uh, let me just double check. So uh, does 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 an MVHR increase SEOP? Um, uh, um, not directly, no. Um, and, and I think when you when you look at putting MVHR in, um, there's not that many systems that can use extraction from within a house um, with a heat pump. And that's another conversation we can have and another CPD we can deliver. But yeah. we look at it with the future home standards and previous SAP. Um, you would automatically be looking to put MVHR in and potentially a heat pump, but they would be two separate items. Right. OK, thank you for that. Um, I'll, uh, we've still got some time, so I'll try and do a couple or more questions before we bring it to a close. Um, so, <coughs> heat pumps tend to ah, heat pumps tend to be installed by specialist companies um, with associated higher install costs, um, uh, whereas most heating engineers install oil and, or gas boilers. Is it likely that an average installer will be able to install heat pumps? So, in essence, I guess breaking that down is. I, I presume is there an element of um, general acceptance of the technology and in essence um, of people are becoming qualified to install these items and etc. Um, I could probably answer that one probably quite well. Um, with the future home standards and I know Francesco and myself have brought it up, there is going to be a huge swing between technologies in this country. So we're going to see, and you're 100% right, there are strong oil and gas and plumbers out there that are used to installing combi boilers or system boilers, and it is the natural norm in this country to have that. And you're, you're correct, there's not that many qualified um, installers of air source and ground source, um, and whether that's, and, and we'll stick with um, air source because, you know, it could be monoblock, it could be a split system with refrigerant lines that's just not the people and this is one of the big problems that the government can see with the future home standards that we just haven't got the correct level of qualified people to do it because it's not only the installation it's also what happens when that heat pump potentially could break down who's going to come and fit it who's going to repair it and also yeah. it's the concept of the homeowner of whether they can um whether they can understand that rather than having a gas boiler in their house, they've now got a box of a big fan sat in the garden. Yeah, I think this is this is one which uh, I have a bit of personal experience on um, uh, from from clients. Um, is how feasible would it be to install a new heating system, for example, in a large rural commercial conversion project using oil fired boilers with a view to converting to heat pump technology such as air source or ground source? Um, in my experience, um, they're probably the easiest people to convert uh, because they tend to understand that the oil fire, fired boilers cost a certain amount. They have to pay for the fuel to be transported up to their units and so on. So they have this sort of general understanding of sort of large chunks of money being taken out over periods of time. Um, so, but anyway, sorry, I'll let you let you carry on with that. Yeah, and and, and you're 100 percent right. That that magic keynote that you said and the, and the step change that the go that the government has taken us through with new build and potentially refurbishments by 2035, I believe, where no one can install a gas boiler. The thing is, most people at the moment, your gas or your oil boiler fails, you would just connect a new boiler onto it. And at some point you would change the heat emitters in the pipework, you know. But if you're upgrading an oil boiler to a um, to a, a, a renewables product, you need to think about radiator sizing. Actually, unless you're going for a high temp heat pump, a normal heat pump, the radiator sizes wouldn't be the right size, so you would have to oversize the radiators. Yeah. So there's there's lots of synergies, in, um, and we've looked at it, and you're probably looking to install an air source heat pump in a domestic premises as a complete system. You're probably looking between 10 and 12,000 pounds. Yeah, I think um, uh, the the dates that you're talking about is in line with the Mies guidance. Is that is that is that correct? Yes, but we we're mainly following the future home standards and the future home standards are saying 2025, no gas going into new build. And then we're, I believe it's 
2035 for no gas going into or no replacement boilers being installed. But then also there's a sort of asterisk there. So some local authorities are pushing a bit harder in regard to that. So, for example, where we're based in Bristol, um, they, they seem to be uh, adverse to having uh, combustion boilers, com combi or boilers, etc. installed in new builds at the moment anyway. And, and, and you're 100% right. And Bristol have, uh, have got requests for um, new properties, especially multiple occupancy, high rise or flats to have a, a connection into their heat network, which we all know about. And we've got products that connect very well into that. And there's there's lots of other things that they're looking at. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I'll do two more questions and then and then uh, we can bring this cook to a close so i'm just going to quickly try and find a couple of questions um so i presume this is quite quite self-explanatory so who is going to provide the design sizing for the heat pumps and how is this covered under uh, professional indemnity insurance etc um uh you okay to answer that well i can't ask part answer part of it but we do a heat, a heat pump design service where we do a heat pump selection against the heat loss of the property but because we're looking at more we have generic hydraulic instructions in a hyd hydraulics that people can follow but it's down to getting the right m e consultant stroke contractor that can design the system correctly because although we would design the central plant the heat pumps somebody has to design the emitters water storage wherever buffer vessels will be needed etc 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 yeah um, and then uh, is there a, a, a let's let's just finish off with a with a with a final question uh, just generally sort of uh, what are your um, usual sort of uh, things that jump to your mind that are recurring questions or recurring issues or recurring positive thing outcomes that come from um, this area that would be good to to sort of pass to everyone in attendance today I think I think you need to look at a couple of things really there. It's decarbonisation. We are we are being pushed that way. Yeah. yeah, there's nothing we can do about that. And that's saving the planet, which is good. But also people, once they get the concept of a heat pump and they get it in, they are seeing huge reduction in their running costs. And as long as it's been installed and designed correctly, they will see no potential issues between their gas system or oil system. Great. Thanks for that. Thanks for that. Chris, uh, thanks, for, thanks for that, Francesco. Um, just before we bring it to a close, we'll show you a couple of events moving forward. Um, but just for everyone's benefit, that was uh, Chris and Francesco from Glen Dimplex. Uh, please feel free to contact them directly if you have any queries or inquiries in regard to any projects that you guys are working on actively at the moment. They'd be more than happy to have a chat. Um, uh, if, uh, as you can see on the screen, we have our next uh, event, which is an exclusive event, which will be on Wednesday coming, uh, same time, same place, uh, which is from Eugene Court. Um, it will be in relation to Welbeck Street Car Park. Um, it's something which he's doing, uh, been presenting uh, via the Facade Institute um, recently. What he'll be doing is he'll be condensing three three separate talks into a single talk over the lunch period. Really interesting. I definitely recommend you sign up and attend. Um, as you can see on the screen, there's a password for this event. So it's C-I-A-T Wessex, all one word. You should be able to see it in the um, comment box, uh, clicking on the link and you just type that password in. Moving forward from that, the following week we have uh, our event with Unreal, um, which I believe is sold out. Um, that is uh, in relation to the AEC environment and what they provide uh, as a uh, software to, in essence, engage with um, uh, from visualizations, etc. Um, so that'd be really good. And we're really looking forward to that. Then following that, we've got 299 Lighting, which is emergency lighting design who done it, which is a sort of a murder mystery type uh, CPD, uh, which is accredited uh, via professional bodies. Um, and then we've got following that, we've got Mac Group, uh, which is on optimizing building physics design, um, which it, they will be an analyzing a project from as small as a £140,000 project all the way up to a £140 million project. Um, and they will be drawing comparisons and understandings of how they get involved and how they um, uh, add value and understanding on those projects. Um, as I said at the beginning, please do feel free to get in touch with us directly if you have any ideas for any additional events. We're trying to create a really engaging and thought provoking series for everybody. Um, uh, so, well, 
well, let's just bring it to a close. But thank you for joining us. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next week or at an event in the future. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.